Um, thanks everyone for attending this evening, um, physically or through the internet. Um, what I wanted to do was just share some information and thoughts about uh, advanced diagnostic imaging uh, that we use in small animal medicine. Uh, you've seen that Simon has already uh, presented his viewpoint and some cases. I'll be presenting, I hope, some slightly different and variations on those cases, but at the end also a couple of comments about uh, the diagnostic accuracy of, of advanced imaging and uh, recognising the fact there still are limitations um, in this technology. So, um, computed tomography basically is um, a type of scan that does use x-rays um, but gives information that typically we cannot see with conventional radiography. The x-ray tube is still a tube that uh, emits radiation but spins around the body of the patient um, and then the x-rays hit detectors that again are situated um, within the gantry or this circular type um, uh, arrangement. These then generate uh, information for a computer to put together and reconstruct an image. So the main things to consider though is, is that the radiation dose is much, much higher than what we see with conventional radiography and this is particularly important with humans who um, we are aware that there are dangers associated with that. The tomograms or the slices that we do create though, however, give us massive insight as to what's going on in the body because there is no overlap of imaging as there is with conventional radiography. So these slices can be a millimetre or even less with some of the better machines and we can see these as um, uh, flat plane images or reconstruct them 3D. So we have a picture here of, of one of these units um, that uh, is visible uh, with Dave Lurie, not Dave Lurie, Dave Simpson up at um, Homebush. Magnetic resonance imaging is probably something I've done a lot more of than CT um, and mainly because of the, the fact that in medicine it probably has more uh, applications to, to the types of cases I see than perhaps it would do for surgeons. This does not utilise x-rays obviously but uh, banks in on a property of water that um, hydrogen ions are the, the main component of water, as you know, H2O. Um, hydrogen ions atoms do actually have a north and south pole and therefore they align within any magnetic field. And it's this property that is uh, used to produce images. So uh, a body, patient, whatever it is, is placed into the magnet, all the hydrogen atoms align. The subject is then bombarded with radio frequency waves which knock these hydrogen atoms off that north-south um, arrangement and then as they gradually move back into the north-south arrangement following the radio frequency bombardment, um, electromagnetic uh, radiation or uh, energy is emitted which is then detected within the MR and produced into an image. So uh, no true irradiation occurs Occur, so it is a very safe technology, um, but uh, quite an expensive and um, large unit to actually put in. There are some limitations though, and uh, particularly in humans, uh, pacemakers and certain implants in the body um, made of uh, metal, particularly any ferrous metals, um, may be affected by the magnetic um, uh, power of the, of the MRI. This can lead to things such as movement of these objects um, and even um, their warming up to the point where they could even uh, deteriorate or explode. Other minor things are such as walking in there with the watch on or credit cards which all get wiped of their information which I've unfortunately been the victim of in the past when I've forgotten to take my wallet out before walking in. Uh, tools, uh, stethoscopes, things like that also can be moved around because of the magnet. So we have these warning signs everywhere and uh, we all uh, go through a checklist before going into the machine that we're not actually carrying any of these items. Um, this representation is really um, just a graph showing that if we have 
um, a pulse of irradiation. Um, we then produce a signal which is recorded um, by the MR itself. Um, the distance between the pulses or the time between the pulses is called the TR time um, and the time from the pulse to the actual echo coming back of the uh, hydrogen items moving is called the TE time. And these are manipulated to uh, make our images uh, of different types of quality um, and to provide different types of contrast when looking at the images. Won't go into the science anymore, but they're the basic things we need to know. So um, again, uh, the types of machines available, this is the sort of unit we're having installed currently at Essendon Fields. Um, it's a fixed magnet, um, low field magnet, which means the cost of the machinery is brought down through not having to have liquid helium all the time. Um, the machine is tilting, so, you, so stress um, images can be produced as well as uh, just uh, straightforward lying down images. Coils are uh, utilised to ensure that we get the uh, radio field directly around the area of image that we're interested in. Uh, so different sizes are there for different parts of the body and uh, in essence we try to cram the uh, largest uh, piece of body into the smallest coil so that there is no dead space, if you like, where there's going to be artifact. So contrast is important for both types of imaging modality because we need to be able to differentiate between different types of tissue and different types of anatomical structures. Um, it can also help us with differentiating any pathological area from um, a area of normal health. So MRI is ideal for investigation of soft tissue uh, type disease or areas of the body, whereas CT scanning is probably um, more useful in high contrast areas and that would be uh, around the bones or within the lung where we've got air as a high contrast area. <coughs> So in MRI, uh, again, very briefly, any particularly white areas are called high signal intensity, any black areas are called low or no signal intensity, and then there's various shades of grey in between um, which reflect the, the different water content of the tissues. So um, pure water and fat tend to have very high signal intensity on most of our scans. Uh, low signal intensity is seen in bone and in air. The major image types produced on MRI, um, we have various names to the different protocols, but the ones you most commonly encounter are either T1 or T2 weighted images. Um, T1 are where we have a fairly short repetition time and they give us quite bright fat content, but the water, it's, uh, any water content is quite dark. Uh, therefore, th when looking at subjects like the brain, CSF will be a, a dark coloration, white matter becomes quite bright. The T1 images are excellent for producing good anatomical detail, so the, the definition is extremely high. Um, we get more information by giving contrast material, which is gadolinium, which is a liquid metal. And um, this works a little bit like iodine does in traditional X-ray contrast. Um, it sits within blood vessels and again will flood out wherever there is any uh, rupture of, of, of vasculature. But it can give you good information again about pathological areas. T2 weighted images um, have a long echo time. Um, and these are characterised by the fat becoming fairly dark and the water becoming quite bright. So in this situation, CSF is quite bright and white matter becomes quite a grey um, area. T2 images are excellent for identifying pathology and the major reason for that is that anywhere that's got inflammation or um, uh, disease tends to have edema 
um, and a vascular um, uh, ingrowth. So we will often find there's a lot of um, white material in areas of pathology on T2 weighted images. However, the resolution is not so good. So a good analogy of this is um, a bit like seeing the, the bright headlights on the car. Um, you identify there's something there, but you can't see what the hell the car is because of the brightness of the lights. Um, and this is how um, people uh, classify the, the T2 images. They'll identify pathology, but often one needs to go back to the T1 images to work out exactly uh, what is involved. So this slide just has T1 and T2 side by side um, to uh, exemplify the difference in the image quality. So which is better, CT or MRI? And it's the usual story of horses for courses. Um, with CT, it is based on radiography, as we said. Um, we get great contrast between bone, soft tissue fluid, and then air, but not that much contrast within that soft tissue fluid category. Um, it is superior for any bone structures and has a particularly short imaging time, which makes it uh, quite suitable for uh, assessing body areas with animals that are perhaps just sedated, as opposed to being anaesthetized. And in high-risk patients, um, this is often a, a big consideration for us. For MRI, the greatest contrast is between fat and water. So it can be very useful in terms of uh, separating out the different regions of soft tissue. There's little or, or, or no signal arising from bone or air, so they just go into the background. It is superior for soft tissue structures, as I said. However, imaging time is longer, which usually means an anaesthetic is required and any movement um, will be uh, causing artifact in the image. Hence, anything within the chest cavity is not particularly well imaged without using uh, particularly sophisticated uh, machinery. The other problem can be that if the uh, area of interest is uh, anywhere near the um, ribs or diaphragm, even within the abdomen, there can be enough movement to actually reduce the quality of the image. So by example, um, we'll have a look at a few body areas and I'll start with the nose, where personally I prefer the MRI because of trying to differentiate the particular diseases that I come across, which are tumors and uh, inflammatory conditions such as lymphocytic uh, rhinitis or uh, fungal rhinitis such as with aspergillosis. So with nasal disease, um, we do see uh, good evidence of edema and, and fluid density around tumors, uh, can show us ventricular collapse of these tissues and um, is quite good at predicting mycotic uh, in rhinitis, which with CT probably we're not able to differentiate quite as easily. So we have here uh, two images side by side. Um, on the left is a CT scan of a nasal area where you can see the bone structure quite nicely, but you can already see that with soft tissues such as the muscles around the head and the eyeballs, it's nowhere near as good as what we're seeing on the right hand side there, which is the MRI image of that nasal turbinate and sinus area. These are both normal animals. So um, first case to, sh to go through is a British Bulldog, four year old. Um, it has had a history of sneezing and discharge from the right nose. It's a bit grumpy and confused and it's quite evident that the dog's right eye is uh, protruding um, further forward than, than what the left eye is, so exophthalmos. Radiographs are confusing and that's probably because the fact that there's a brachycephalic and it's hard to actually uh, identify you know, where the nasal chambers and sinuses are. So on MR, uh, the image on the left shows the two eyeballs which are not cut in the same plane because the, the right hand side seen on our left um, is further forwards. We can see uh, on the left hand side near the top the air filled sinus 
and soft tissue with some turban that's still present uh, left of midline. But to the right of midline, everything has been effaced by what looks to be a relatively homogeneous um, soft tissue density. Going back a little bit further into the brain area itself, the structure in the centre is the actual brain, but you can again see there is um, some degree of asymmetry um, where the midline is shifted towards the left and the areas that normally would be visible as ventricles are not uh, particularly evident. But it is all still relatively homogeneous. Once we go to T2 images, though, we can see that that same part of the head, the sinus has a particularly bright signal, which is uh, due to the fact there's fluid present in that sinus. It is not soft tissue, whereas further ventral within the nasal cavity, there is soft tissue. It has a few regions of uh, high intensity signal, which is probably going to be hemorrhage or fluid accumulation within the tissue, but most of it is soft tissue. And so therefore T2 has been better at actually showing us where the exact pathology is. Um, this is a view taken from uh, a dorsal plane, which is uh, the same plane as you would be using if you're patting this dog on its head uh, and slicing bits off the top. Um, so we're, we're looking down further. The dog has got quite an evident um, dilation of its ventricles, um, so it has a hydrocephalic look. However, this was regarded as still being probably normal for the breed because there's such a variation in how much fluid they have in their brains. But again, on the right-hand side, um, we can see that the sinus area is full of a soft tissue type intensity signal um, on both of these views. And with the T2, um, smaller uh, images, but you can see quite clearly that um, this is a quite a hyper intense signal, which is the fluid in the sinus, whereas when you go further down uh, to the level of the eyeballs, we start to lose that and we in fact have got um, soft tissue as opposed to fluid um, occupying that part of the nose and that's where there probably is a tumour. And on the sagittal plane, same, uh, same sort of images, but again you can see how dramatic um, this sort of soft tissue uh, occupation of the caudal nasal passages and sinuses has become. So the diagnosis on this dog was lymphoma by biopsy and he was treated with chemotherapy which staved off uh, clinical signs for a number of months before he finally succumbed. Uh, the next case is a five-year-old uh, female uh, Rottweiler set across. Um, she's had a six-month history of, of mucopurulent discharge. There's been frequent episodes of nasal bleeding and when looking at the dog's nose, the alar folds that normally would have been heavily pigmented um, are quite pink, so there's been deep pigmentation occurring. And for some of you, you'll, you'll already perhaps identify what that may mean. So images-wise, um, the major finding on these dorsal views from this dog, and you can see it's got much more nose than the bulldog did, um, is that large parts of the nose are totally empty of anything. Um, so you could argue that that might represent bone, but it'd be solid bone within the nose, which you know does not occur. What this is is representation that turbinates have been replaced by air. So we've had some pretty dramatic turbinate loss. These images also are showing that there is a hyper intense signal um, on what mucosal lining is left in the actual nasal area. Um, and again, we have a mixture here of T1 and T2 images, but uh, again, there's material in the sinuses which is going to be an accumulation of uh, mucus and fluid. Um, we have turbinate loss and we have this hyperintense lining of the mucosa. And the, the hyperintensity of the mucosa and the loss of turbinates together in most situations signifies that we've got mycotic rhinitis. And the diagnosis on this dog uh, was aspergillosis and it was treated with the clotrimazole flushes um, as is fairly standard therapy. 
Um, just a single image here of a cat on CT, again, just to demonstrate how 